Hello everybody, welcome back to Oakwood Cemetery for another one of our virtual tours. Today we're going to try something a little bit different and that is instead of a theme, we're going to focus on a section of the cemetery and today it will be the battle section. Uh, it's different for us. Uh, it will still be a longer tour because there's a lot to be said about these folks. This is a very historic section for us, but the good news for you, you don't have to walk as far. So, anyway, we'll get started. Um, and speaking of the battle section, this is the battle family. A good number of these markers here have to do with the battle family. Here's the patriarch of the family, uh, William Horn Battle. Uh, I hate to disappoint you uh, state people and you dookies, but this, if there's a UNC family, this is it. Not only did uh, William Horn teach law at uh, Carolina for several decades, uh, he was also a, a, a North Carolina S uh, Supreme Court Justice, but uh, he had six surviving sons. All of them went to UNC. Uh, two of them died in the Civil War, uh, but, but the rest uh, lived to a very successful life. One particularly important to Oakwood is Kemp Plummer Battle. Kemp Plummer Battle's over here, the cross on the left. Kemp was what we consider to be one of the founders of Oakwood Cemetery, which I guess is why this section is, is named the battle section. Um, he too was an attorney. Uh, during the Civil War, he actually ran a railroad. And uh, after the war, he eventually became president of UNC, uh, which had been shut down during Reconstruction for a number of years. He's a very important person in North Carolina history, and beyond that, his great love was history. He's written a classic history of UNC. He's left us uh, something of a history of the founding of this cemetery, so very important to us here. Uh, his son, Kemp Plummer Battle Jr., right here in front of you, uh, became a noted uh, physician. Uh, and I should mention he taught for several decades uh, at the medical school at Shaw University, one of the first, uh, if not the first, black medical school in the country. Again, he taught uh, uh, medicine and so forth there. I'm not sure if he did it gratis or if he was actually salaried there. I, I don't know. Anyway, lots to be said about the battles if we have more time, but let's press on. Uh, this is another prominent uh, Carolinian. The stone on your right is Daniel Gould Fowle, one of our uh, three governors in this section. Three of our seven governors in Oakwood Cemetery are in the battle section. Uh, uh, Governor Fowle uh, was a Confederate soldier for a time. Uh, he became the Adjutant General of North Carolina, again trained in law. Uh, and he's noted because he was the first governor not only to live in, but to die in the governor's mansion. And you may know the stories. The ghost of Governor Fowle continues to haunt the mansion. Uh, the story is that he keeps coming back looking for the bed in which he died in the mansion. Uh, and if you've been on any of my tours, you've heard the story of my conversation with Governor Perdue's husband through the fence. I said, has the governor ever seen the ghost of uh, Dan Fowl? And uh, he said, well, we haven't seen him, but the highway patrolmen who protect us have seen him, and who can argue with them? Anyway. Uh, Dan Fowle had several children, the first children to live in the mansion, and one of them is here. In fact, Robin and her trusty camera may want to swing around the back. You see Mary Haywood Fowle Stur Starnes, I think they pronounced it, um, one of the first children to live in the mansion. She was the uh, great-granddaughter of John Haywood, our first mayor, the granddaughter of Fabius Haywood, who is uh, buried here next to uh, Dan Fowl. Um, and she, quite an eccentric person in a way, uh, she lived a long life, and um, 
some of her adventures, she remembers the day. She tells the story that when they were building the mansion and they dug the foundation, it would fill up with water after big rains. And she, as a little girl, remembers paddling around in what would to be the basement of the mansion. Uh, she married a fellow named Walter Starnes, who was a, an executive with General Electric. He was an electrical engineer, got himself in big trouble in the 1930s, a case that made it all the way to, to the Supreme Court, <coughs> excuse me, which uh, GE lost, and several of the officers, including Starnes, were fined for price fixing, an antitrust violation. Um, Mary carries with her a not a very nice reputation, if you will, in the sense that she was a bit uh, arrogant, has been used the word to describe. She used to walk around town with a gold-headed cane, and I think people came to fear it. Uh, in the old days, Christ Church used to charge for its pews. That is, you bought a pew, and Mary was apparently the last one in Christ Church to give up her paid-for pew. Lots of stories about the Fowls and the Starn. She lived in Haywood Hall for many years. By the way, she's the one who left Haywood Hall to the Colonial Dames, who still, I guess, uh, oversee it as a tourist spot. We're going to visit another uh, of our three governors in the battle section. This is William Woods Holden, and I'll be honest with you as a tour guide, he's the most difficult to talk about. So much to say, a confusing, if you will, life. Um, so uh, I'll do my best. Uh, he was born in Hillsborough, a bastard, uh, literally. And I think for the rest of his life, a lot of people came to consider him just that. He made many enemies, switching political positions. Uh, some would say an opportunist. I think not. I think he genuinely had a, had a, a deep feeling for the common man, if you will. Um, anyway, he was a newspaper man. From a young child, he was apprenticed to a newspaper, didn't have a good education, was a newspaper man for his whole life. In fact, he wound up owning the Standard, which became one of North Carolina's most widely read papers. It was the organ of the Democratic Party. Initially, he was in favor of secession, supported it, but over the years, he changed his mind and actually, during the Civil War, became the leader of the peace faction. So again, he made enemies on both sides of that issue. Uh, since he was a, uh, well, he became a Republican, and since he was, had been against the war, if you will, during the fighting, uh, he became a candidate for provisional governor, appointed by uh, Governor Andrew Johnson in 1865. He served about half a year and then lost the gubernatorial race that next year to Jonathan Worth, who's another one of our governors, just not in this particular section. He won the governorship as a Republican, our first Republican governor, uh, later on, and that is when he got himself in trouble. Why? Because he fought vigorously against the Ku Klux Klan, which after the Civil War became active in North Carolina. He fought so vigorously against it that he made enemies in the legislature who eventually had him impeached. Um, and removed from, from office. The first governor in the United States, not just to be impeached, but rather to be impeached and then actually removed uh, from office. He uh, spent some time away in Washington, D.C., came back and retired to his house, one of the grandest houses, they say, in Raleigh, which stood on Nash Square in its day. A bit of trivia for you, had one of the first workable bathtubs uh, in Raleigh. Anyway, well remembered um, in some good ways and in some not so good ways. He had a son who was also in politics. He's buried right here under this marker, which is a classic Victorian marker. You see the uh, shroud and, and then the tassels, which uh, indicate uh, w wealth in the family. This is Joseph. Joseph Holden, as I said, became uh, active in politics from Wake County. In fact, he became the Speaker of the North Carolina House, and he has special meaning for us here at Oakwood because he is one of the state leaders who signed the charter for the Raleigh Cemetery Association. We celebrated 150 uh, years of that event uh, last year. 
Uh, he, by the way, not so much in this heart a politician, a poet, said to be a wonderful poet, uh, who would have made a name for himself had he lived longer, but he actually died a relatively young man. Joseph Holt. Here's another one we get a lot of questions about, as you might imagine, one of the more dramatic, some think the finest uh, uh, memorial in Oakwood Cemetery. This is Bartholomew Figures Moore, another one uh, like we have uh, uh, were told him that there's a lot to be said about. Moore was a uh, lawyer, an attorney, and he is noted for one who resisted secession. He opposed secession, he thought it was a huge mistake. Um, and uh, in fact, he, uh, while not an abolitionist, he argued a case in the North Carolina Supreme Court in the 1830s, which he won, which gave right to slaves to resist violence at the hands of their masters. A remarkable case, the state versus will for you attorneys out there. Uh, anyway, uh, Mark Moore, as I said, resisted uh, secession. And since he would not take an oath of allegiance to the Confederacy, he never argued a case in a Confederate court. He did argue cases, though, in the state court of North Carolina, which did not require an oath. Now, he gets a lot of credit for resisting secession. However, we've done a good deal of work on his estate. We've, we've uh, read through his estate papers. And yes, he certainly did support the Union and so forth during the war. His estate papers reveal that a good deal of his fortune was tied up in U.S. government bonds. So it's hard to tell sometimes whether his loyalty was first to the Union or to his, uh, his estate. I, that's always hard to tell. Anyway, he had a big family, two wives. Uh, his first wife uh, uh, died uh, uh, childless. He married her sister. That's not unusual. We have a number of people out here like Moses Mordecai who married the sister of the of the first wife. And anyway, he had 11 children, and all of them, save one, are buried here in this lot. The 11th is over there. Uh, she married one of uh, Moore's law partners, a man named Gatling, and Mrs. Gatling is, uh, is over here, his 11th child. So he kept the family uh, together. Some information about the stone, we often get the question, that uh, uh, marker was made by a firm um, uh, Van Gundem and Young from Philadelphia and in terms of today's prices if the estate papers are correct that would cost you $60,000 today based on the prices from uh, around uh, 1880. Uh, the bust we think was carved locally, and we think the stone cutter might have been a man named John Caton, who was active in Raleigh at the time. He has many stones out here, and in fact, he was the partner of W.O. Wolfe, the father of Thomas Wolfe, when Wolfe was carving stones here in, uh, in Raleigh. So a lot to be said about Moore. I just wanted to mention one more person uh, if we want to walk over this way. You see this very simple stone here, just a headstone really, Lucy Moore Capehart. Uh, Lucy was one of his daughters, and she married a fellow named Capehart, and you you have seen their house, the Capehart Crocker house, if you will, at the corner of Polk and Blunt Street. Big stone house, it was moved to that spot. It has a port to share, it's now a state office building. A lovely building. Lucy, a very interesting history. She was a uh, cripple for most of her life, but very active in real estate and, and other things. Left a remarkable will, assigning everything that she owned down to the smallest sugar bowl to somebody in her family. <laughs> remarkable woman. Um, just as we pass by, this is another battle. Uh, one of the sons who went to UNC, an attorney. This is Richard Henry Battle, who led the uh, Raleigh Cemetery Association for many years. Just a little bit of trivia. It was he who gave the dedicatory address when the first Rex Hospital opened in 1909 down on South Street. Very prominent, well-respected fellow in, in Raleigh. In addition to our governors and so forth, there are some folks here you wouldn't expect to be here. Like Dr. Reuben Knox. Reuben Knox married a Raleigh girl, 
and uh, he went to California where he had a ranch outside San Francisco and uh, he I think was trying a very curious experiment he was developing a boat that could dredge river bottoms to find gold this was during the gold rush well he apparently took that boat out one day and the darn thing sank and it took him and three others down with it even Knox died uh, in the at the northern end of San Francisco Bay uh, unsuccessful in his search for gold uh, the Knox family still uses uh, uh, Oakwood Cemetery to this very day we are passing by J.W. Watson here um, and his wife. He has been called the father of North Carolina photography. He worked out of Raleigh for many years. Uh, very, very prominent. Took uh, some early pictures of Oakwood Cemetery. In fact, his daughter Hattie, the literary types, was the first wife of W.O. Wolfe, the father of Thomas Wolfe. You hear us mention him a lot because we try to follow his record here in in Oakwood Cemetery. Anyway, J.W. Watts, a very prominent in photography. This is Richard Sharp Mason. He was the pastor of Christ Episcopal Church down on Capitol Square, and in fact, he was the pastor under whom the church was built in uh, 1854. Uh, now, as you can see, as Robin moves around the back, you see his, his cross has come down, and that provides Oakwood with uh, uh, up, up, up one of its preservation challenges and it works very hard to preserve these stones and if you want a sample of that preservation work there's another one of our governors you can see his obelisk over there believe it or not that obelisk came down lying flat for a time and you see how nicely it's been preserved through the efforts of the cemetery to make it right again and it probably looks better now than it did when it was put up Anyway, uh, Reverend Mason, long at Christ Church, uh, proud to have built the church, proud to have built the bell tower. However, perhaps not so proud it was under him that the church split, as you probably know, and a portion of the congregation went over to and founded the Church of the Good Shepherd in uh, 1874, um, where they didn't charge for their pews, by the way. One of the reasons for the split, I believe. This is the Smeeds family uh, plot. Again, another family very important to uh, in the history of Raleigh and probably well known to many of you. Albert Smeeds, a New York born, Columbia University educated Episcopal priest was invited to come to Raleigh to in effect resurrect the school, a boys school which has failed and turn it into a girls school. This is in the 1830s. And he did, he did so well, uh, it became, of course, St. Mary's School, at which he ran one of the very few girls' schools, or any school for that matter, to run actually through the Civil War. Um, if you can imagine being the head of a girls' school, still holding classes during the occupation of Raleigh after Sherman had captured the city, in 1865 and he bivouacked hundreds of his troops on the St. Mary's campus. So you have all these 18 year old soldiers and the girls still living in the dorms and going to class. What a job for a school administrator. Again, if you've been on our tours before, you've heard the General Sherman story during his several weeks in Raleigh after the capture of the city. He would go around and make courtesy calls on various people, including St. Mary's school and as he walked away from meeting the faculty and some of the students at St. Mary's, he turned around to tip his hat as he departed the school, only to see the girls and I guess some of the faculty doing this. <laughs> Not a very kind uh, memory he would have carried away of St. Mary's. Uh, anyway, his, when he passed away in 1877, his son took over. Bennett uh, Smeeds, you actually know him already, though you don't know it, because when Mary Fowlstarn's father died in the governor's mansion, uh, the Bennett Smeeds took her in for a time. Very kind gesture. He was not an administrator at heart. He was a teacher, but he did a very good job running the school for 22 more years. And we're still in the Smeeds section. You see the family lined up there. 
And this is John uh, Smeads. He was a brother of Albert Smeads, but like Smeads, he was a Episcopal uh, priest. And like Smeads, he headed a school. And the school that uh, John headed was St. Augustine's. St. Augustine's University, and uh, the normal school, that is a school for teachers, I believe, I may be wrong on my count, but the first five heads of St. Augs were white Episcopal priests. And John was one of them. He led it for about a dozen years. So it's really in the family, this whole education uh, business. Both schools, St. Mary's, as well as St. Augs, sponsored by the Episcopal Church. Um, and it just so happens that John is near a little cluster of St. Augs people, and we'll visit some. So here we are in another one of those um, uh, Episcopal priests who headed St. Augs. In fact, this one was the founder of St. Augs. That is, J. Britton Smith, the J for Jacob. Not only was he the head of St. Augs, but he was also the superintendent of Oakwood Cemetery. In fact, the first superintendent of Oakwood Cemetery, as far as we know. You see all of our superintendents over the years get a little plaque in front of their grave, assuming they're buried here. And Jay Britton Smith is no different. Um, he, didn't, he didn't stay long as supervisor of Oakwood Cemetery. I think uh, the, his, his job at school uh, took more time than and he could afford. Um, but not a very popular man, and I don't mean to be cynical here, but the plaque says, in loving memory, when you read about Smith, there wasn't much love that was extended to him, I'm afraid. I think a rather irascible man. His personality seemed to grate on a lot of people. A uh, hard man. Um, in fact, in those days, students at St. Olive's had to work the fields to help cover their tuition, and he made his son go out and work in the fields, and the boy died. He died as a young man, um, was buried up north. In fact, we have a receipt from Smith where he purchased a metal casket to ship him north. That didn't sit well with his wife and one of his daughters anyway, and it was apparently those two ladies who laced one of Smith's uh, morning beverages with, the coroner said, enough cyanide to kill 20 men, and Smith was murdered. Uh, charges were never pressed for them. They went back up north, but uh, Smith uh, died in 1872 with a mystery about him that really isn't fully resolved today. Let's go meet some other St. Augustine. Here's another one of the five. Uh, we've just come down from Smith's grave at, on top of, sort of the top of the hill. Aaron Burtis Hunter, you see DD, Dr. Divinity, behind his name, another uh, Episcopal priest who headed uh, St. Augustine's for well over 20 years. Um, but it's probably his wife who's more remembered. Sarah Hunter, whose name is also on this stone, uh, realized the problem that blacks had in those days when they were not welcome in segregated hospitals. There was no hospital for blacks officially in Raleigh. And uh, Sarah took on that challenge, first creating uh, the equivalent of a hospital in a home on the St. Augs campus and then helping to raise money and sponsor the building of St. Agnes Hospital, which became uh, the largest hospital for African Americans between Washington, D.C. and Atlanta, Georgia. Considered something of a teaching hospital. Um, uh, many physicians in Raleigh would spend their time there, volunteer their time, both as teachers as well as practitioners. Uh, and I, I, th I have no way to prove it, but I like to think that when the hunters picked their spot here in Oakwood, they did it with her work in mind, because from her gravesite, you have a nice view in the trees over there of what's left of St. Agnes Hospital. Now, it closed down when Raleigh schools 
uh, desegregated in the 1960s and eventually I think fell in on itself. Uh, it's really just a shell of what it used to be, quite literally. And um, I'm not sure anything could ever be made of it, though I'm certain St. Louis would love to do something, something with it, a teaching hospital or something like that. But, but uh, it's hard for me to imagine that happening. Anyway, a nice thought. And certainly a wonderful achievement of Sarah Hunter. Of St. Augs and St. Agnes, uh, yet another name comes to mind with a wonderful story, really. Uh, Mary Glenton. She was uh, born in Ireland. She went to school in Chicago, got a, uh, became an MD, a medical doctor, and became an Episcopal missionary. Uh, she spent some years in Alaska, of all places, helping to uh, tend to uh, Inuits. And uh, she spent time in China also. And it was in China that she contracted some sort of tropical illness that eventually, apparently, infected her leg and she had to have it amputated. And she took on a um, artificial limb, which she used to call Peggy. She, she would refer to her artificial limb as Peggy. Uh, she came to uh, Raleigh to supervise St. Agnes. And ironically enough, it was in St. Agnes that she passed away. She went in for surgery for gallstones and um, Think that it didn't survive. But anyway, uh, again, a wonderful contributor to certainly to St. Agnes and to Raleigh's history. All right, we're back on Chapel Circle, still in the battle section. I told you it was big and that some folks had some pretty colorful stories. Here's another one. Uh, this is Captain William Ward, uh, who was captain of a ship that is called the first great uh, nautical disaster of the 20th century. Uh, he was captain, as it says on his uh, tombstone. Robin will focus in on it. He was the captain of a ship called the Rio de Janeiro, one of the Pacific Mail steamship lines, it was called. And in 1901, he was transiting the Pacific, I think most immediately from Honolulu, California, but originally Hong Kong. He'd begun in Hong Kong, and most of his passengers were Chinese. And most of his crew was Chinese. The problem was that only two people on a crew of 70 or 80 spoke English. And that created real problems for uh, the Rio de Janeiro or William Ward, because when they came to San Francisco, they waited outside the bay, beneath where the br or, or outside where the bridge is now. Uh, they waited for the fog to clear, but not long enough. No sooner did they start in and the fog sent in again, and they hit rocks which tore out the bottom of that ship. The ship went down in eight minutes. A uh, hundred and twenty some lives were lost including Captain Ward, who went down with his ship. And it is said that given the tides, the ebb and flow at, that, at the mouth of San Francisco Bay, um, uh, the wreckage, the litter, uh, was found for years after. And in fact, it wasn't until a year or so later that they found the body uh, of uh, Captain Ward, what remained of it, on a beach in San Francisco Bay, and were able to identify him only by his watch. That's here to so. You may remember from our previous um, tour, we sh we introduced you to John Lamson, who'd flown for the 95th Aero Squadron in, during World War One, Quentin Roosevelt's uh, squadron. Here's another aviator. Uh, you see on the stone there, Aviator World War. I think they thought would be that would be the last of the uh, world wars. There wouldn't be a two, so they didn't put a one. But this monument, not quite the same monument as for Lamson, remember, which listed all of his campaigns that he engaged in in France. Uh, Rutledge Field, uh, an odd spelling of the name, but this is the way it's spelled. The son of a very prominent attorney here in Raleigh. Um, Trained as a pilot, 
trained as an aviator in World War I, uh, and uh, during the course of which he wound up in many airfields around the U.S. and wound up at one on Long Island, New York, when the armistice was signed. Never made it to Europe. So we certainly admire him for his uh, training and his willingness to risk his life as a World War I aviator, which is a pretty risky <laughs> occupation, but uh, not quite the, uh, what might be implied by, by the stove. Clearly his parents were proud of what he'd accomplished. All right, well, we're about to finish uh, this tour of the battle section of Oakwood Cemetery. And I'll be honest with you, we thought we might begin this tour with a little trivia question uh, and then answer that at our last stop. Um, but we decided not to, we weren't sure of the time and we thought it might just irritate you. <laughs> so here's the trivia question we were gonna ask. What was, the G what was the GAR? And what year was the first memorial parade that they held in Raleigh? Now, that may not sound particularly important, but it is in a way unusual given Raleigh's stature during the Civil War. It may be hard to recognize it now, but North Carolina was a southern state during the Civil War. And um, the GAR stood for Grand Army of the Republic, which was a, an association of former Union soldiers here in Raleigh. And we have one with us. In fact, we have, here's one of seven that we know of, seven Union soldiers who were buried in Oakwood. I suspect there are more that we just haven't identified yet. William Martin came into uh, Raleigh about the same time as General Sherman did. He was from Allegheny, Pennsylvania, fought for a Pennsylvania regiment, uh, and stayed in Raleigh. I think initially was with the Freedmen's Bureau and stuck around long enough not only to marry a Raleigh girl, uh, Martha Kirk, uh, uh, Kirkham here, but also to be appointed our police chief. Now you remember William Woods Holden over here uh, as a, a provisional governor. Well, that gave him the privilege, if you will, of appointing local um, officers. And I believe the number is about 3,000 people, the local officers that Holden appointed. Well, remember, he was a radical Republican. And he appointed William Martin police chief in Raleigh, North Carolina, a former Union soldier. And it was Martin who was a member of the GAR and who helped to organize our first Memorial Day, very informal thing in those days, Memorial Day Parade, 1868. Remember, the women had organized Memorial Day for Confederate soldiers in 1867, and I think Martin was going to let that pass by unanswered. Uh, the next year, in fact, um, in 1869, he was the Grand Marshal of the GAR Parade. And you say, well, who would come out for a Union parade in Raleigh, North Carolina, just a few years after the war? Well, he had a built-in parade. Why? Because remember, those days, Raleigh was occupied until 1871 by federal troops. So he had troops, not only did he have troops to march in his parade, even if not many citizens did, but he had a band. So it was probably quite a festive occasion for him. Uh, but I've always thought it strange that so soon after the war um, that uh, there would be that GAR-sponsored event. I believe and uh, I, if anyone could correct me on it, the first time that a Memorial Day celebration was held at the cemetery uh, was after World War I, 1924, I think. So, but that doesn't mean that Union soldiers weren't unrecognized before then, and that was largely thanks to William Martin. That's it for the battle section. You see it's a big one. Lots and lots of important people here and lots and lots of stories. We don't have time for them all, but we hope you'll come out and visit us. It's not, it's a, it's a big section, but it's not so big that you can't enjoy a nice leisurely stroll through. Come visit. <laughs>